All Hi. right, everyone. I believe uh, that uh, high energy music uh, starts off the next event here at the Design X uh, day one of Remote Design Week. Uh, today's panel uh, being uh, on uh, inclusivity in and by design. Uh, and so let's start off uh, by going around and uh, introducing the panelists that we have here today. Um, I know we all kind of uh, approach inclusivity and diversity from kind of different directions through different lenses and, and with our different kind of kind of life experiences. So uh, Aoife, why don't I start with you? Um, pretty sure I pronounced the name right, which is uh, a win. Amanda. And <laughs> All right. Uh, so, you know, tell us about, about yourself, about what you do, and kind of how, how you approach uh, kind of inclusivity and, and, and in design as a topic. Sure. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aoife O'Dwyer. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a creative director with the UX Design and Strategy Agency uh, headquartered in Dublin, working globally. Um, so, I'm, I'm Irish, so it's PM here now. Um, and yeah, I, I've been in design for about 10 years now and I've, I've specialized very much down the UI and visual side of things. So I guess that's kind of the angle that I approach a lot of this type of work or this kind of thinking is around um, the visual aspect. But also I come to the space um, a, a lot thinking about, you know, my personal experience as a woman, as a queer woman, as a fat woman. Um, and there's like all these different aspects which I think impact my work day to day and how I think about the work I do and the work that we do at the agency and you know how we interact with people in design as well so yeah that's me very happy to be here absolutely great you're here the 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 personal experiences contribute so much to uh everything that all of us uh do into our work and so it's so so important to acknowledge those as well uh going in uh, in alphabetical order uh Rooney why don't you uh, uh give us an intro Wonderful. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rooney Goswami, and my pronouns are also she, her. Um, and my path to design, and particularly inclusive design, is a little bit meandering. So my family is from Kolkata, which is a city in eastern India. And I spent a lot of my summers growing up there when I was little, but I actually grew up in the DC serves in Fairfax, Virginia. And because I was switching back and forth a lot between those two very different cultural texts from a young age, I was always really interested in how different people perceive the world and particularly how what we pay attention to shapes what we actually experience. And that led me to actually studying neuroscience. Um, mm -hmm. And along the way, um, I, I realized I needed to be doing something a little bit more creative with my career, which is when I discovered product design. And it was super exciting to apply what I had learned about perception and attention to the interfaces that we spend so much of our time attending to. And my master's thesis was actually making a graphic novel interface that used eye tracking to shift narratives based on what you paid more attention to. Um, over the past few years, I've taken another shift in my career and really gotten into design systems where I think a lot about how we can ensure quality, whatever that means, and we can unpack that later uh, in every single experience, which means thinking a lot about accessibility standards, inclusion, and in the case of Lyft, which is where I work currently, uh, things like road safety guidelines and all of these different platform guidelines. And one thing I'll note is I don't consider myself an expert in inclusion and accessibility by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm always eager to learn, especially from all of you. So excited for our chat today. You know what? Learning uh, is the most most important part, and uh, no matter how long you've been in this space, you still have something new to learn every single day that you're in it. Um, although, I mean, approaching design kind of from a neuroscience uh, point of view and from a pathway, uh, do you think of it as, as a science or an art? Or both? I think it's both. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I think that I know plenty of former artists and former scientists who each bring their own different lenses to design. And I think that's what's 
so exciting about the field is that um, there's there's so many different definitions of what design can be. Um, I think a through line is problem solving, but the the way that you're solving those problems is shaped by your experiences and, and hopefully uh, can be through a perspective of inclusivity as well. Dig exactly. into today. <laughs> exactly. Design is is either an artistic science or a scientific art. Uh, and uh, we'll just leave it there, perhaps. Uh, but that moves us on to uh, Cheryl. Uh, glad you could be here. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be here as well. Um, so my name is Cheryl Kababa, and my pronouns are she, her. And I am the chief design officer from a consultancy, a design research strategy and build con consultancy called Substantial, which is based in Seattle. And uh, I appreciated Rooney's like kind of reference to taking a meandering path um, to arrive at where I am today. Um, I, that really resonated with me. Um, I, you know, I started my career as a journalist and then kind of moved my way into technology as a product designer. And over the last 10 years, I've um, been focused on design research and strategy. And more recently than that, um, focused on uh, design for social impact and thinking about how within the design practice, we can more readily design for outcomes. Um, and so part of that focus has been one, working with especially technology companies and kind of thinking about how they make more ethical considerations within the course of their work and take greater responsibility for the cascading effects of their decision making. And so really applying that system thinking lens to that work, as well as um, I do a lot of work in the space of education that is focused on students who are typically from historically under-resourced communities and are typically um, from racial minorities. And so a lot of the work that I do is focus on students who are black, Latino, um, uh, multilingual learners and students experiencing poverty. And so we try to take an equity centered design lens um, to the research work that we do um, within our education work. And, um, and I've developed some tools, um, especially around things like, um, ethical considerations as we integrate digital technologies, um, as well as like principles that we use uh, to kind of interrogate our own privilege as researchers and uh, strategists um, as we kind of do this work that is um, focused on equity. So that's kind of um, what I've been working on. Uh, like Rooney, I don't consider myself an expert or like the practice um, that I'm driving is uh, it changes and is shifting every day and I'm learning something every day. And so I think um, this is the kind of space where it's never really, the work is never really done. And so uh, that's kind of the lens you bring to the table. Exactly. Design uh, is, is a process uh, and a journey, uh, just like accessibility, which is the lens that I approach uh, things from. Uh, for those of you who don't know me uh, as your moderator, I'm Sam Pru. I'm a person who is blind. I'm a, a screen reader user. Uh, work with Fable, uh, and of course, you know, accessibility has always been something that I live and breathe, uh, and and that is kind of my approach to design. Um, I used to sort of think of accessibility um, as something that developers and engineers did, uh, but it has become more and more clear that design has to take into account inclusion and, and diversity uh, even before anything gets engineered or, or gets developed. That said, Cheryl, uh, your introduction uh, kind of fits so perfectly into one of the first uh, topics that I really want to talk about because it feels like over what has been happening over the past two, three, and four years, the technology sector has really been having some excellent conversations about ethics. And I think designers have been participating in those conversations. We've been talking a lot about dark patterns and about doom scrolling and about kind of uh, all of the unethical, probably unintended outcomes that can come from our designs. But I don't think we talk enough about uh, disadvantaged groups, about underrepresented groups, etc. when it comes to the intersection of ethics, inclusivity, and design. 
And so I, I wonder, Cheryl, what kind of what do you think are some of the design decisions that we're making that have unintended, unethical, undesirable con, con, kind of um, consequences for some groups that perhaps are being left out of the design process and of the research process? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, for example, we're using a lot of machine learning in our products. And I think for many designers, it's a little bit of a black box in terms of like what's happening with um, that kind of software kind of making decisions. And you see the repercussions of that all the time. Um, I think a good example is like how AI is used for things like predictive policing. It tends to affect um, you know, black and brown folks a lot more readily than it does um, people in other demographics. Um, and then what's like problematic about it is that it's really hard to decipher why that is happening because there are so many inputs, there are so many different proxies. There's a lot of historical data that is super biased that is then um, kind of feeding those kinds of algorithmic decision making that ends up kind of um, a a discriminating against um, certain populations. Um, so I think there's a couple of things like one, I think a lot of my interest in the space um, is born of like feeling like an underrepresented minority in the technology practice. Like I've never worked with anyone on the same team who's had my racial background, for example. Um, mm. And so just like realizing that has kind of shown me like how unlike, you know, the world populations, <laughs> like our technology industry um, populations are. And so, I think you know part of what we need to solve for is actual representation. There just generally needs to be more representation within technology firms. Um, and then on top of that, there needs to be kind of like an acknowledgement of our personal experiences and how those inform our design practice. Like a lot of what I do is actually interrogating um, kind of how user-centered design doesn't necessarily kind of service in the best ways. I mean, a lot of things that um, you were kind of alluding to Samuel, like in terms of like, just the kinds of cascading effects that we're experiencing are born of um, decision making that you we might historically have considered good design. So doom scrolling, for example, like that has just like enough randomization uh, like in within the software that keeps you kind of interested kind of keeps you emotionally invested um and that kind of like behavior that it encourages would have historically been considered that is like good design that's actually successful design you're getting people to use your product in a way that is you know like really engaged <laughs> mm. um there's a direct benefit of use of like the information that you're getting but if we think about just like the societal repercussions, it's a very different story. Mm, yeah, and and so I mean, I, I guess sort of uh, throwing the question out there: How do we redefine what is what is success in in our work, uh, and how do we get get the systems that we are inside of to uh, to understand and and to go along with that definition, right? Because they want more hours on screen, maybe they want more clicks, maybe they want uh, you know, more engagement. And so what, what metrics should we be using and how do we, how do we convince other folks that these, these are the right message, metrics? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to continue unless like someone else wants to jump in there. Well, something that came to mind to, when you were speaking, Cheryl, was like what you're describing there around like what would have previously been considered good design and like a point that's already been made about awareness and learning and like I think one of the biggest challenges is on an individual level and on an organizational level is to, you know, accountability. Um, and I think the bottom line when it comes to convincing like the wider ecosystem, both like the, the design community, organizations, I mean, the cynic in me is like, well, you know, we're coming to a stage where I really feel like, you know, a lot of consumers expect to um, have this uh, type of, like an inclusive practice behind their brand and when they find out that it isn't this exclusionary, it's inaccessible, like actually really damaging to a brand. Um, I think especially the, the younger generations that are coming up as well are quite conscious 
Um, and I think really fundamentally, like we're getting to this kind of moment of like, think about the cost of not, you know, incorporating inclusive practices um, as opposed to the, you know, the, the short term perceived cost of applying them. It's kind of where my head's at. Yeah, there's a lot. We're having. We're also directly experiencing some of those costs. I think, perhaps, mm -hmm. in 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 a way. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, this this must be, Rooney, a topic that you're kind of close to because when you start out in in kind of neuroscience, right, a, a lot of these things that would have historically been called good des good design kind of stem directly from from that research, right? And so, is that what do we do? How do we make sure that that this kind of research and this kind of knowledge, as we as we obtain it, is is used in ways that are that are productive and that are inclusive and that are beneficial for everyone? Yeah, I, I, and I and I think this is something that I've been, as you mentioned, like very aware of because of my background in studying attention and, and even through that work, um, different people attend differently. <laughs> so if you have attentional deficits, like you're processing visual data differently. Um, and everything that we learn uh, in like graphic design 101 and when we're designing websites and mobile websites is things like the F pattern is that you're you're going to be scanning websites in the same way. And we, at this point, uh, have gone so far in that direction of capturing attention, capturing eyeballs, and we haven't really thought about, okay, is this good? And, and how do we how do we undo this now that we're at this stage where we've decided mm -hmm. that collectively we we don't want to give our attention away as our most valuable resource? How do we attach like real monetary cost to this? And I, I don't know the solution to this, but I'm glad that the, the discussion is starting to happen. And as Wifa mentioned, it is a matter of accountability. We need to hold ourselves accountable as designers and not blame, oh, it's the system. Oh, it's it's the C-suite <laughs> in whatever company that I'm working at. It's, it's not my responsibility as an individual designer. How much power can I have? And I think we need to look at ourselves and say, okay, so maybe I've contributed to this. How do I now knowing what I know, how do I undo that? And, and some of that is rethinking what, what success actually looks like, <laughs> putting it back in terms of like, why, why are we designing? We're designing to solve human blooms. Why, why can't we take our success metrics and put it in terms of how well we're solving those problems that we initially set out to solve, uh, challenging the uh, industry standards of like daily active users and the growth metrics and really thinking about, okay, can we challenge ourselves uh, to come up with new metrics? Why, why does it always have to be this way? And then giving ourselves permission to fail too. I, I think there's a lot of fear in doing something wrong. Um, and then if you do something wrong, then you backtrack it and then it, it blocks other people from trying something new. So many of the experiences we're building are going to have unforeseen consequences. We just have to listen. <laughs> when we're negatively impacting people and see mistakes as growth opportunities and then do the step of creating systemic changes that make sure that we're at, at the bare minimum, not making the same mistakes twice. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's the main shift is reducing the fear in like messing up 
just embracing that mistakes are going to happen and then doing our best and and having accountability at the personal and the company level yeah we we as as, as in the digital realm are, are so lucky it's not like we just built an uh, 80 story uh, high rise building that is bad and must now be torn down right it's a lot easier to change things i think for us exactly. in in a way but you know i really loved what you said about figuring out what we can do and and doing what we can and that just sort of shifts so well into in, into another thing that that i like to talk about which is which is inclusivity and and innovation because i think too often we get focused on the can't i can't do that because it would be inaccessible and i can't do that because it might have different cultural connotations and i can't do that because you know uh, people in countries with slower internet might not be able to use it and i can't do this because it has unintended consequences and i can't how do we how do we shift people's thinking from like oh well what it means to be inclusive and to be accessible uh is to like design everything for the lowest possible common denominator and and you know well the most accessible website is the one that only has text on it no graphics or video and and you know things like this how do we how do we shift people's thinking into an innovation mindset and and i mean what are some some examples perhaps in in some of our careers or our, our experiences of of when that's been done well and what the kind of positive results of that have been yeah so from a systems perspective as, as a design systems team, we're, we're the ones like making the rules. So we're, we're always seen of as like the, the sticklers. <laughs> um, and we often hear the complaint that standards reduce creativity. And in, in practice, really the opposite is true. Like guidelines are essential <laughs> to the creative process. Without having those, those guardrails, then you, what are you even designing? Um, it's, it's back to that old thought of like, bring the science into art or the art into science. You need to have a well-defined problem. You need to know what problem space you're even in. And so having those guardrails actually encourages you uh, to think outside the box to think creatively. Um, a, a recent example where this came up was we, we started uh, bringing in some of our internal operational tools into our design system. And uh, these tools are only used by internal folks and, and they're very data heavy. And we got a lot of pushback initially. Uh, we heard, no, everything has to be like tiny, tiny. We have to cram in as much data as possible. <laughs> it's like your accessible pointer target size is impossible, um, is, is like what we kept hearing in those initial conversations. Um, and as we dug into it more, we, we didn't say, no made it a fight from the beginning we were like okay tell us tell us about what data needs to be shown tell us about like why why you think that it needs to have an inaccessible pointer target size um and as we started asking more questions we realized that of course it wasn't true <laughs> They, they could use a accessible pointer target size. And when we started standardizing the way that the data was displayed, it actually made it a lot clearer for everyone. <laughs> um, and and it made the, the conversation really easy where they were like, oh, we, we just have to use the standardized sizing system that you've already built for us. Oh, like we don't have to compromise on the amount of data that we're showing. Um, and, and it just was like a, a click, like an aha moment in, in all of these different teams' eyes where we, we didn't like fight them. We just showed them, look, it, it's not actually as impossible. You just maybe are unfamiliar with this or it's change and change is hard. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think 
that's that's kind of the approach that I always take is just asking more questions, figuring out, okay, like where is the actual like heart of this block that you have? Why why do you think that this is impossible? <laughs> and and how can we actually show you that no, this is a great opportunity for you to get a little bit more creative and make something that's clearer for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Aoife, I think you said you sort of work in, in, in a more visual design a aspect and, and the visual approaches to things. What's your experience been like with that, with pushback towards, oh, well, I don't want to follow color contrast guidelines. I don't want to have accessible <laughs> targets. Well, but because if it's accessible, it'll be ugly, right? That, that's kind of a, a thinking. That that's is a, a thing lie. I've literally heard people say to me, and it's not true. And, it's and not you know, true. What's, what's your experience been, been like sort of, sort of in those discussions and pushing back? Yeah, so I mean, for me, like this is a big part of my day to day. And I, I can wholeheartedly say that some of the best work I've ever done has been, you know, under strict guidelines or restrictions, you know, perceived restrictions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really about a mindset shift. Like, I mean, everything you, you introduced this topic with like, I can't do this, I can't do that, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I find it really exhilarating to be like, but what can you do? Like, I think mm -hmm. that's like the fundamental basis of all in, like innovation. Like it's a perfect recipe for innovation. Um, it also means that, you know, more people are gonna enjoy the awesome work that you create. So. You know, I, I think it is, you know, fundamentally a mindset shift for me. Um, and I think as well, like what Rooney just, you know, demonstrated perfectly is something as well that I, I do talk about a lot, which is, you know, demonstrate that value. Um, sometimes it can be a bit harder to convince people if you're like, if it's not in their experience or if it hasn't affected them negatively or they haven't seen the positive impact of it. Um, if you can do something, even one small thing to demonstrate, look, look how much better this is look how much more inclusive it is it's not excluding anybody it's by definition inclusive so you know it's it yeah it, it's this is a big one for me but like i think yeah it comes back to the mind shift mindset shift for me absolutely from from uh from i can't to i don't know how and then you get the opportunity to to discover how um Figure and it you know it back when back when twitter was was 140 characters only um it, it never ceased to amaze me how many complex ideas people could express in 140 characters because they had to, the, whereas they otherwise would have taken three pages to tell you the same thing, uh, which, which, you know, is just fascinating. Uh, but Cheryl, I want to I wanna bring you in because, you know, you've sort of also worked with, with um, cultures and folks who are historically un underprivileged. And, and there can also be a feeling that, that designing for these folks who maybe don't have the latest technology, don't have the, the, the latest and greatest all the time is is another, like a blocker, like a, you know, oh, it's this thing that I have to do or that I that I don't want to do. And and kind of what's what's your experience been been like in, you know, moving people towards thinking about innovation rather than thinking about problems and, and the lowest common denominator? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky to work in a space that is really like strategically oriented and where there isn't like, there isn't necessarily an assumption that outputs will be digital, right? And so I think, um, you know, good example is just, um, as we think about inclusive design and innovation, like a lot of the work that I'm doing in the education space is framed around targeted universalism. So really kind of thinking about groups that are um, historically at the margins and designing for them and mm -hmm. realizing that you can have universal goals in which what you design for them will benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the, tr the, the, some examples that everyone's familiar with are things like um, subtitles on um, movies and films and curb cuts um, that, you know, are designed with like a certain audience in mind but benefit a lot of other people situationally. Um, and in education, it's things like, it doesn't have anything to do with digital products. It can do with certain types of pedagogy, like discourse-based instruction, for example, is shown to benefit students, you know, from racially minoritized backgrounds. And, um, but pretty much all students perform better when they have that kind of instruction. Um, and then there are things like culturally responsive pedagogy, which, um, which is basically kind of like acknowledging like the cultural backgrounds of your diverse students 
Um, and that benefits all students as well. And so kind of thinking about things through this lens of like, if you serve a certain population that others are probably, um, are very likely to benefit from it, um, it makes a lot of sense, just like in terms of innovating from a design perspective and kind of looking at how you can frame potential solutions. Absolutely. In the in the kind of accessibility lens, I always talk about how designing from the edge inward uh, builds products that are that are better for everyone because they're more accessible and more customizable. And I think it seems like there's there's a lot of overlap um, uh, there, just you know, with with a kind of general general inclusion. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great audience questions, uh, and so I'd, I'd love to. Uh, take a couple as we uh, continue on this kind of excellent uh, conversation. Uh, and so we've, we've got one from, from Leah. We've been talking about, you know, metrics and success criteria and, and what that is. And Leo asks, um, um, how can you leverage empathy as a metric? And that's a, a really interesting um, question that, that, that sort of made, made me um, think and and i'd love to sort of hear um uh, you know your your opinions on that is is it something that can be metricized and if so how do we do it i can i can jump here i, I probably would say like trying to turn empathy into some sort of metric is probably not the right way to frame it i mm. guess what i the way i'd probably frame it is just like how how can we more readily integrate empathy for those who are unlike yourself into basically our processes? Um, mm -hmm. And how can that result in better outcomes that can then be sort of metricized or, you know, turned into KPIs or something along those lines? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think um, it's an important factor in how we approach our work as designers. You know, we, tend to lead with empathy um, and basically use our role as designers to kind of help facilitate other um, other people's knowledge, expertise, and experiences and um, work to translate those things into potential design solutions. Um, and so I think it's just kind of like integrating the role of building empathy more readily into our work. Like who is typically not exposed to people that we should be designing for? How can you gain more empathy through having a more diverse team to begin with? Um, and I think I don't like, I, I, I'm having a hard time imagining how it might be turned into a metric. I think it's more about like, how do we articulate it within our processes and within the kind of shape of our work to begin with? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. R Rooney, maybe there's something, uh, you know, neuroscience, we can just sort of measure someone's empathy factor. No, I'm being sarcastic. That does not <laughs> sound like a good idea at all. <laughs> yeah, def definitely not. No, I, I totally agree with what Cheryl was saying, where we, it's, it's less of a metric. And I, I think one thing that people are always looking for in these in these discussions is like a checklist <laughs> like mm -hmm. i will be inclusive i will be accessible if i do xyz um and and i think that the we think that way because that's that's what's easy to get buy in <laughs> for uh it's easy to like package things up in a way that people are people are familiar with metrics um and what's hard is doing the like mindset mindset shifting work that Weifa was talking about earlier um and i i think one strategy that has helped me in having conversations with folks who might not even know what we mean when we say like designing with empathy, like not not everyone is reading the same articles that we're reading. They, they might not have a design lens. They, they might not know what that means or what the value of it, it means. Um, and I think one strategy that I found useful is trying to like figure out what lens they're coming from. So, so actually like taking the empathetic lens myself and figuring out okay like what's important to you like what 
what about this uh like is is interesting to you where are you coming from and then trying to do the translation work <laughs> myself um i gets it's definitely challenging and but i think bringing up uh sh doing showing instead of telling um and mm -hmm. and giving people like some quick examples of here's here's how i was able to actually make a huge business impact by bringing in a more diverse group of users that we tested on here's how we were able to actually come up with a totally like different line of business by hiring <laughs> more inclusively and uh not seeking answers from people who look and think the same way that we and just giving like building up our arsenal of case studies <laughs> that we can share with people um who are either unaware or actually combative when you say things like i design with empathy um and and being like okay well you care about like growth metric here's an example of how i changed my process and it actually impacted that metric that you'd care about this this is awesome I, i'm actually really interested to hear your take on this rooney because every time the topic of empathy comes up it always brings to mind to me something i read recently around um the distinction between empathy and compassion so you know that empathy is like seeing or hearing others experiences but having like um like a negative emotional reaction and you know feeling distressed and wanting to withdraw from that experience versus compassion where it's more you see and hear those experiences but you're driven to like try and enhance or improve the welfare of that person that you're you know have compassion for and I think that can be really useful I find it really useful in my practice just even in terms of like if you're doing um, exercises like you know how might we statements like it's it's moving from something around you know how might we avoid this negative thing to how might we improve this particular situation um so again like uh, you know, I mean maybe a mindset is a thing for me um but that's something that I think day to day uh, I think can be useful when you're thinking about empathy and distinguishing between um, what that experience is on an individual level, what the designer, or as somebody who's going to be, you know, interacting or using um, the outputs of, of design work, that distinction between empathy and compassion, I think, can be really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 hearing you both about the the process work too, right? People want a, a deliverable, and they want to say, "We've done it. We are and we are inclusive now. We're done. Uh, we we did the Badge. including." <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. We want we want a badge, and uh, uh, that's what we did this quarter. Uh, but it, it doesn't doesn't work that way, does it? Um, <clears throat> really interesting question uh, from the audience uh, from from Alex around uh, I inclusivity and 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 context. Um, Alex asks, can a digital experience adapt to be inclusive based on context? We change content based on our audience to get higher conversions. Can we be more inclusive where we need to? And, you know, I, I think that's really, really interesting. Going back to, you know, the AI that we were talking about and, and these things sort of at the beginning as we, as we opened the panel, how a lot of this happens, a lot of this optimization, a lot of this uh, changing of content to get conversions. And how do we do that in a way that is inclusive? And, and is there an opportunity to do that in a way that actually makes things more inclusive? That's a good one. Thinking, isn't it? It's it's <laughs> it's it's about it's about shifting the the I guess perhaps some of these negative things to be to be more positive, right? How can we, um, you know, there's a, there's a big thing in the in in the in the ad industry, right? Um, well, we want to we want to show our ads to this particular group of people. Uh, and but you know maybe we don't want to target this other group of people that can lead to to disenfranchisement 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 speaking is hard and then let me do this professionally um, and and yeah I don't I don't know is when we're optimizing content are we always dis 
including someone or I mean it feels like there's probably ways to to better optimize it but then we also don't want like you know to be creating a different experience for someone with a disability or for someone from another culture or something mm -hmm. I, I don't know I guess this is actually reminding me of a project we did a while back so we, we did a <coughs> work with the um the digital team and the, the Irish government mm -hmm. um and obviously a website which is a government website needs to be super um accessible um basically it's for everyone um, and one, there was one kind of project that came up around, um, uh, you know, people that had, you know, difficulties at hearing uh, or people that were, you know, using ISL or sign language. Um, and it was a big part of what was incorporated into the website. Um, and there was a new feature that we worked on where it would, again, it's this idea of contextualizing, you know, um, optimizing the, the content for the context. Um, and it the underlying system was able to you know know if you were um, somebody that was hard of hearing and it would automatically besides some of the key um, written content would like you know um, bring up a a video of somebody you know translating um, in Irish sign language and it was an mm -hmm. automatic trigger because um, it knew already that you were a deaf user or a hard of hearing user um, so I do think it's, it's totally possible and should be done because those videos were being recorded anyway. Um, so I guess the challenge we had was, all right, how do we make sure that the people that need them get them with you know the least amount of effort possible? Absolutely. And then of course the other challenge is how do you how do you do that while also preserving privacy, right? Because yeah. I think perhaps uh, whether you are in the market for a new car may not be quite as sensitive to you as as whether you have a cognitive disability or are someone who is queer or, or something like that. And and so how do you how do you put that in somebody's context to get them what they need without being uh, without without revealing information that they may not want revealed? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you touched on that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just feel I, I mean I feel like that that's a huge issue. Just like I was thinking about. Um, just consent. Like I was on a website the other day and I was about to purchase something and there was a little like icon in the corner and then I could sort of like expand it and then I could make some accessibility choices. Um, and one thing I was already curious about is like, okay, where is this information going? And then like, what's going to happen in my browser experience going forward if I mess around with it? And so how do we preserve consent? How do we preserve people's privacy if we're thinking about doing that? If we're thinking about the ways that that kind of personalization is happening today, it's oftentimes having like pretty like terrible ramifications, like the kind of customization on um, social networks and the way that your feed is curated sort of algorithmically kind of ends up like brings us to like pretty bad places, you know, like mm -hmm. in the um, Facebook sort of um, testimonies last was it just last week? Oh my God, I'm just <laughs> I know. <that>. Um, <laughs> just last week, they're talking about just like how it affects teenagers and their well-being, right? Um, just like kind of scrolling through these feeds that kind of double down on these negative and extreme emotions um, can be really problematic for your mental health. And so, how? I mean, I'm having a hard time like just imagining how can this be done in a good way that does not violate your privacy in a way that could end up going down a very dark path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that as an industry, we're slowly moving away from an opt out model to an opt in model where like, so the, the early <laughs> sites and the early patterns uh, they they were mostly in the opt out where uh, we're just going to do something and if you know about it and you feel bad about it then you opt out or we're going to make it like hidden under a bunch of different hoops and layers and in really small print and it might be invisible and the link might move um, and now we're moving towards a more of an opt in model but even there just explaining what you're opting into uh, mm -hmm. is is a challenge in and of itself. Um, and and this came up like pretty recently, where um, there was a new feature that uh, one of our teams was trying to introduce into the Lyft experience, where um, we would have the option 
of a short walk uh, to have a faster, more efficient drop-off time. Um, so you would walk a short distance uh, to get to a pickup spot that was slightly farther uh, than your intentional, it, than your original uh, pickup spot. Um, and as you can imagine, um, being <laughs> from the world of inclusion and accessibility, uh, this was not great for a, a whole bunch of people for a lot of different reasons. Um, and fortunately, the feature was not released before they came to our accessibility task force. Um, mm -hmm. And they were like, but what is the problem of just trying an experiment and trying to A-B test this feature? Um, and of course we told them this this makes it unusable <laughs> for a, a like large percentage of our user base and it brings up safety concerns, it brings up all of these concerns and of course they were really receptive to that. Um, but the bigger issue there was, um, they said, but they can always opt out of it. Um, and that's when we realized, okay, this is actually a shift in how we're thinking about like user permissions in general. Like it, it can't be that we grant all of the permissions at the beginning in the terms of service that no one reads. And then <laughs> you don't actually educate people going forward <laughs> into any any new feature that is using one of these things. Um, I think a lot of interesting work is happening there uh, with the latest iOS versions. Um, and that's, that's a whole topic for another day. But I, I think as an industry, we need to be a lot more cognizant of opt-in like, how do we surface consent when tied to feature releases in a way that actually makes sense to human people and not to, like, bots and people who are fluent in legalese? Exactly. It, it uh, you know, I think maybe we have a lot to learn from the security industry there because they, uh, you know, in the in the early days of, of sort of Windows decided, well, we'll just ask the user's permission for everything. Do you want to let this thing do this? Do you want to? And of course, users get, get, get choice fatigue and they just hit yes. And so I'm sort of imagining pop-ups, you know, do you, do you want to let them track you? Do you want to show your location? Do you want to show your gender? Do you want to let them know about your disability status? Do you want to let them know? And, and users are just going to cl start clicking yes if we, if we prompt them too often. Uh, and so I think that's a really interesting challenge um, that uh, we are good to discuss and good to solve. Hey, uh, but I think we're uh, coming to coming to a close here. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to um, sort of uh, close with with the final question and, and go around uh, and also sort of get get everyone's final thoughts and, and final words as we draw this panel to a close of, uh, you know, anything that you'd uh, like to leave folks with. And so our, our final um, uh, audience question. I'm going to guess this is uh, Kai Kai asks, are there any short programs, institutions, or certifications that designers and developers can leverage to understand uh, accessibility uh, and, and inclusion more deeply? Uh, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, I think on the accessibility part, there's, there's a lot of great training uh, that is available to folks, uh, you know, whether it's uh, just kind of, uh, you know, uh, from organizations like the W3C who have created WCAG, uh, whether it's from, uh, you know, uh, just kind of on online folks uh, and, and online searching. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of conferences that have taken place over the past year and that will continue to take place online that are much lower cost to attend. And I think that's one of the great things uh, that, you know, there's a silver lining to everything. I think so much more material and information about design and inclusion has been opened up to folks because you no longer have to go to, uh, you know, a, a conference that's going to cost you $10,000 in travel just to get there. Uh, we've built online communities over the past two years that I think will continue to exist and that folks can learn from. Uh, so let's let's go around. Um, Eva, final thoughts, closing remarks that you'd uh, like to leave folks with? Um, 
Well, I kind of just want to mention first that like this has mm-hmm. been awesome. I have learned so much <laughs> from you all. Um, I think that w- would be actually pretty high up on like a, a closing thought for me is this idea of <coughs> constantly learning, you know, constantly, you know, this idea of, you know, that that question was around, you know, how can people learn about this topic? Uh, luckily, you know, all the things that you might want to know about the internet probably live on the internet. So certainly from a digital perspective, there's tons of material. Uh, there's tons of great people talking about this. Um, I'm sure if you've been attending the events today, you'll have, you know, come across lots of different folks that you can keep an eye on. There's tons of books. Um, but I think that that message of, you know, constantly learning, constantly holding yourself accountable, um, and just make this part of your practice today. Like even in the smallest way, if this is like brand new to you, which probably isn't now because you spent an hour um, listening to all of us hearing some <laughs> experiences. So, you know, you're already, you know, ahead of ground level. Um, and just, you know, keep, um, keep keep putting it into practice. I mean, I guess people talk about design as a practice, and I think that's really key. It's like, just make this part of your day-to-day, um, and you will, it'll become, you know, more second nature to you as you, as you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Design, design really, really is a practice in, in a way that I, uh, you know, so some people think about it. Oh, it's like medical practice. It's not a word that, that really has meaning anymore, right? But I think in, in design, it it absolutely is. Um, uh, Rooney, why don't I uh, pass it to you for some some closing thoughts? Yeah, I'm absolutely echoing what Ifa just said. It absolutely keep designing with curiosity and gratitude in mind. Every day is a new opportunity. If you mess up, it's not the end of the world. Just listen when you do. Um, I personally, I'm super encouraged by uh, the fact that we even have a full day on this topic in this conference. I, I think the industry has changed so much in the past decade that I've been a part of it. I think a decade ago, uh, we weren't even using these words in a way that uh, people applied to digital design. Um, we, a few subset of people were accessibility experts <laughs> um, and we would give them huge like contract jobs to just fix everything. <laughs> and now I think there's there's a shift happening. I think companies and individuals are realizing that no, like good design is not what's the top 10 designs on Dribble. <laughs> good design in like involves inclusion as part and parcel of it. Like in order to actually solve people's problems, you need to think about the people. And I think a shift is happening and it's super inspiring and encouraging to me as a design practitioner. Absolutely. Uh, we we are shifting the industry. Uh, change is was slow, uh, but is steadily increasing in pace, I think. And that's a, such a great positive uh, sign for all of us. So uh, Cheryl, uh, final, final words, final thoughts as we uh, bring uh, this excellent panel to a close. Yeah, I mean, I just want to reinforce what both uh, Rooney and Ifo have been saying all along, which is, um, yeah, I think we just need to reframe um, and focus on who is typically excluded. I think sometimes about a young colleague of mine, like I think sometimes designers don't feel empowered to do that. And I think sometimes about a young colleague of mine who was tasked with creating features for, I think it was like hotel, frequent guest program members, so like really privileged folks. And she convinced the clients that we were working with to focus on a different um, set of potential users, which were people who were living with hearing impairment. And she made the case for it and then sort of like flipped the script on like what they were going to be focusing on in terms of their user stories. And so I think anyone can feel empowered to kind of push um, inclusive design as a practice. And it's all about just kind of like reframing the space. And I want to put a little plug in for two of my colleagues are working on a web accessibility guide that we're hoping to like uh, release shortly to the world. And um, it should be like a nice little resource as well. 
Absolutely. Uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, keep in touch and uh, would love to hear more about that as it comes into uh, fruition. But that said, uh, I have taken all of the time uh, that we are allowed for this panel. Uh, it's been so great. I wish we had, uh, you know, an another hour to continue the discussion because it's so important. But perhaps next year uh, we will be back, perhaps uh, in person or in some kind of hybrid format. But uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank the three of you uh, for being here and for, for participating. Uh, I know I've learned a lot as part of this conversation, uh, and I know that uh, everyone uh, here at the conference has too. Um, so thanks so much, and uh, I will call this one to a close. And uh, hey, uh, there's uh, channels on Slack for those of us who would like to keep this discussion going uh, and continue the conversation outside of the panel uh, format that we've had today. So absolutely, everyone, feel free to uh, uh, engage there as well. Awesome.